Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Implementation of a High Throughput Wastewater SARS-CoV-2 Detection Method, Providing Actionable Data to Your County or Your Campus. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Saris Nanosciences. To learn more, visit them at sarisnano.com. Now we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. Now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Smurthy Karthi Kayan, a postdoctoral research associate from University of California, San Diego. Dr. Karthi Kayan, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Susie. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you've all been having a good day so far. Um, to just a little bit of introduction about myself. My name is Murthy Karthikeyan. I am a postdoctoral researcher in Rob Knight's lab at um, UC San Diego. And at UC San Diego, we have been working on a multifaceted approach for um, SARS-CoV-2 surveillance, um, where we conduct diagnostic tests in tandem with in large-scale environmental surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 infection dynamics as well. Before I dive into the technical aspects of the talk, I just want to give a quick introduction or a brief overview as to why we chose to look at wastewater-based epidemiology for SARS-CoV-2 in the first place. So SARS-CoV-2, like a, a lot of other coronaviruses, can be shed in the stools of patients who are infected with SARS-CoV-2. So whether you're pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, or symptomatic, you will very likely shed the virus um, in your stool if you're infected. The issue here is a lot of people who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic are actually not going to know if they even have the infection. And by the time they develop symptoms, some may not at all, and go and get tested, they would have already spread the infection unknowingly to a lot of people. So by the time a person develops an infection and goes and gets tested, there's a good at least one week lag by when you know that the person is positive. So in order to eliminate that lag, we start looking at wastewater because even before you show symptoms, you're shedding it in your stool. So if you start looking at wastewater, we would get a better idea of how many people in an area are actually infected. And this not only helps to keep up with the low testing rates, but it's also much cheaper than having to test large populations at a time. So here at UCSD, we have a three-pronged approach at looking at the wastewater for SARS-CoV-2. So in, we do sewage testing on the UCSD campus. We also look at the wastewater from a couple of school districts, elementary schools, um, where there are young children who are attending school on a daily basis. And we call that program SASE, or Safer at School Early Alert System. And on a larger scale, we're also looking at the entire San Diego County, and we're looking at their wastewater treatment plant. There's only one wastewater treatment plant for San Diego. And so far, this has been slightly updated as of today. We've processed over 15,000 wastewater samples just from campus, over 1,200 samples from the school district in San Diego and over 200 samples from the San Diego wastewater treatment plant. So the reason we started off, the reason we started off um, for San Diego County testing was mainly because if you notice on the top left corner, these were the caseload per day in just San Diego County. So we, uh, when we, when the pandemic first hit, San Diego County especially was not doing nearly enough testing and they were only testing the symptomatic cases. But by now we know a lot of asymptomatic people can just as much spread the virus. So at that point only symptomatic people were getting tested. There was no widespread asymptomatic testing. So we still did not know what the true pandemic toll was at that point. So we started testing um, the wastewater from July 
So at that point, it looked like a big peak, but now in hindsight, July was maybe just a tiny blip. So at that point, we were recording just probably 100 or a couple hundred cases a day. But at its peak, we were recording nearly 4,500 to 5,000 cases every day. So we started sampling from the beginning here, and we're still sampling from Point Loma wastewater treatment plant now. Um, San Diego is right here, which is um, the southern, uh, almost the southernmost point of California. And uh, here is the U.S.-Mexico uh, border that you can see. So in order to test the San Diego County's wastewater treatment plant, we went to the only wastewater treatment plant that serves all of San Diego, and it's almost two and a half million residents. So all of the two and a half million residents um, wastewater essentially ends up at the wastewater treatment plant, the picture you see on the right. It is called the Point Loma Wastewater Treatment Plant. It does one step of wastewater treatment and then it discharges the um, treated effluent into the ocean that you see here. We sample here every day and this is a pretty large plant. It processes 175 million gallons um, per day of wastewater. So here, essentially, you will see the map of the, San, of the San Diego County. And all of those lines that you see in purple are essentially the sewer lines. And all of these sewer lines essentially connect to the Point Loma Wastewater Treatment Plant that's right here. And the circles, the differently um, sized circles, are essentially the caseload in that zip code. So, and they're adjusted for population. As you see towards the south, this is the border. We have a higher proportion of cases from the zip code compared to the north. But by the end of the day, all of these get discharged to the Point Loma wastewater treatment plant. So when we first started um, looking at wastewater for SARS-CoV-2, we wanted to try out pretty much all the methods available for trying to concentrate the virus from wastewater. So unfortunately, unlike clinical samples or nasal swabs, we cannot directly extract the RNA for SARS-CoV-2 and then look at the PCR. This is mainly because it is super dilute and you also have a lot of solids and other junk in wastewater. Essentially, anything that people flush down the drain is going to come up in your wastewater sample. And unfortunately, the signal might be too weak and we might have to concentrate the virus initially before we can actually even see if there is any SARS-CoV-2 in there. So far, this is the biggest hurdle when it comes to analyzing SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater because the vital concentration step is expensive, it's time consuming, and it might take like a person hours to go through one sample, and it'll take a long time for us to process a few samples a day, and we can do more than maybe 10 or 20 samples a day, assuming you work all day. So in order to look at why this was an issue, we tried looking at the typically used concentration methods for wastewater. So a few of them um, are shown. These are the most commonly used methods for concentrating the virus from wastewater. So one of them is you use a filter, so vacuum filtration units to filter out where you expect the virus to adsorb to your filter paper and then you extract the RNA from there. The others are centrifugation and ultrafiltration based approaches and PEG precipitation, which is polyethylene glycol based precipitation is also another commonly used method. But right off the bat, you can see these are very time consuming and they're also expensive and the number of raw materials you need for each. When you're doing 20 samples a day, it's not a big deal. It's okay, you can still manage. But if you're doing 200 samples a day, it cannot scale up. For instance, we tried all of these methods and when we started with um, filtration, it used to take me six to eight hours to filter just 50 to 100 mils of wastewater at a time. And this is near impossible if I have to do 200 samples a day. So because of all these bottlenecks, we look towards some other procedures where we can first automate them, make them cheaper, and then maybe we wouldn't have to hire like 50 different people to process our samples. So in order to do that, we looked at the nanotrop particles. We mainly looked at it because um, we, we wanted to see if you could automate this entire procedure and make it hands-free so we wouldn't have to babysit the whole process or the protocol and we could process hundreds of samples in one day. So in order to do that, we took raw sewage. We did not filter or do any 
sort of pre-processing because that again is another bottleneck and we don't have that, that kind of time or resources to do that for many samples. So we took our raw sewage samples and then we added the nanotrop particles. So the nanotrop particles are essentially magnetic beads that specifically bind to viral particles. And then to separate these viral particles from the rest of the junk in wastewater, we use an equipment called uh, a kingfisher. The kingfisher is traditionally used for um, cell biology or RNA and other extraction methods, not specifically for sewage. But the cool thing about the kingfisher is it has a magnetic head. So we decided um, we wanted to try using that uh, liquid handling robot to see if that would do the concentration and the extraction for us. Since the nanotrap particles are magnetic based, the magnetic head was able to pull the viral particles which are attached to the magnet, thereby leaving all the junk behind it. So this way we're getting a more clean and concentrated version of the viral sample by discarding all the crap that we don't need. So once we had that sample, we were able to do the RNA extraction on the same Kingfisher robot, and then we did the RTQPCR for screening for genes that are specific to SARS-CoV-2. To give you a better idea of what this process looked like, so uh, what you see here on the leftmost is the Kingfisher um, liquid handling robot. So you see the magnetic head that goes up and down and homogenizes the sample and picks up just the good part, in this case, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus from the wastewater sample. And the, pic the um, video you see in the middle is the same Kingfisher that is able to do the extraction of 96 wastewater samples at a given time. So this process um, can extract the RNA from 96 samples in about 36 minutes. And the concentration step, which normally takes can take like six to eight hours for just a couple of samples, is reduced to 45 minutes on the Kingfisher, and it can take 24 samples at the same time and process about 24 samples in 45 minutes. So just optimizing the simple concentration and extraction step, we already have a hundredfold reduction in time. And finally, we also do the qPCR plating using an EP motion, which is another liquid handling robot. So you can see that in the rightmost corner. So what an EP motion essentially does is it does the plating for the master mix and also plates the samples that you get from the Kingfisher, which are extracted RNA, and puts it along with the master mix for qPCR. So it can process 384 samples in 20 minutes. So this saves us a lot of time and effort and energy in trying to uh, pipette out really small volumes of master mixes into 384 well plates. I have done that manually as well, and it's not a pleasant job, and there's no way I can do 384 samples in 20 minutes. So essentially, this is this was a huge time saver for us. And once we decided we had a protocol that could process hundreds of samples a day, we took all of the samples from our Point Loma wastewater treatment plant and processed it to this protocol. But in order to make sure that this protocol was sensitive, so the main difference in this protocol was it only took 10 mil of wastewater compared to um, a lot more wastewater input that you needed for the other protocol. This could do with just 10 mil, which significantly saved us costs. And our, and our um, consumable costs for a sample was maybe 13 to $15 per sample compared to we used to spend much more per sample. But in order to make sure that this protocol, which is much faster, was comparable to the traditionally used protocols, we had to, um, we had to run some tests to see this was just as good, if not better. So in order to do that, we used actual SARS-CoV-2 vital particles that we got from our collaborators at the BSL-3 lab. So we spiked in a dilution series of the actual SARS-CoV-2 viral particles into the wastewater. And then we did three different concentration methods. One of it is the one I just showed you. The other one is the PEG or polyethylene glycol-based precipitation method. The other one is filtration. For all, for all samples, which were run through three different methods, we got the highest recoveries when we actually use the high throughput method or the nanotrap method. We feel that it's probably because there's less variation since the robot is doing the extraction compared to manual extraction, which can vary depending on the lab tech or the person who's handling the samples. The other thing we found was the results were highly reproducible. 
and our replicates were very close to each other in terms of results and we didn't see too much of a standard deviation when we ran multiple replicates. So here, this plot just shows our standard curve when we put known amount of virus into our samples. We did nine full serial dilutions and four replicates were used per um, sample dilution. And we got pretty good recoveries um, when we used the high throughput methods as well. And the last plot on the right just shows the difference in CQ values for the same sample that was run with three different methods. When we used the high throughput method, we got one of the lowest CQ values the lower the CQ values, the more sensitive or the higher the viral load. So this gave us confidence in um, using this um, high throughput approach for all our samples. So using this, we ran all of our Point Loma or San Diego County's wastewater treatment plant samples using this method. And the plot on the left shows the viral load we saw from wastewater on a daily basis, and which is shown in orange and the other plot that is shown in blue shows the number of cases San Diego County was reporting on a daily basis. We found a very good correlation between the viral load we see in the wastewater compared to how many uh, infections were recorded in the county on a daily basis, with one major caveat that we saw this uh, trend at least five to six days ahead in the wastewater compared to what we saw in the actual uh, San Diego County's um, report. This could be because a person is still shedding before they get tested and also there are delays in testing. And at that point, we were not having nearly enough uh, testing rates compared to how bad the infection rates were in Southern California. So this gave us a good confidence that we could probably use wastewater to as an early alert system to tell us how the next few weeks are going to be, are the cases going to go up or are the cases going to go down? This also gives um, public health um, enough time to do any interventions or focus testing on certain regions or increase or decrease testing based on what the wastewater load is showing us. So we wanted to use this data not only to see the trends, but we also wanted to see if we could forecast into the future how the trends were going to be. So we wanted to see, okay, one week from now, where we still don't have the wastewater data yet, will the cases be going up or will they be coming down or are they going to be staying stable? So in order to do that, we wanted to build a predictive model, which takes the wastewater data and it also takes the day of the week. So the day of the week was included in our model creation mainly because um, the county sometimes, if there was the weekend, they didn't process as many samples and suddenly they would process all of these backlog samples on Monday. So we would get a weird spike on Monday, but that's mainly because their testing rates um, lagged over the week or long holidays. So we wanted to also take into account the discrepancies that that might have. And we also took the new number of positive cases to build a model. So we used the first two months data as a to build a training data set and then use that to see if he can predict into the future. So the plot shown here shows the actual um, caseload that San Diego County reported on a daily basis, which is shown in blue. What is shown in yellow is what our model predicted would be the caseload on that particular day, give or take um, a few. And then what is shown in red towards the end shows what our model is forecasting into the future up to three weeks on how the caseload is going to go, whether it's going to go up or down. So we found that the model was able to give extremely accurate data for at least one week into the future. The accuracy came down slightly for the second week and third week, which is expected. But we felt that this gives at least a good seven days head start to see how your county is going to be doing. So as you can see, the red coincides with the blue pretty nicely, even uh, for one week into the future. So this gave us confidence that we could probably use wastewater data for um, looking at how the infection dynamics in a community are. But um, this has its own disadvantages in a sense because San Diego County is a large county. So like I said, um, Point Loma is taking the waste from nearly 2.3 million residents. So it's obviously, um, you know, catering to a large population. We wanted to see if we can use the same principle, but on a smaller population. 
if let's say we have 10 buildings, can we check the wastewater of 10 different buildings and then just ask the people to um, test for the buildings where we see a positive signal? But in order to do that, we had to know if maybe, you know, is one building's wastewater signal enough for us to pick up, let's say, that building has 500 people, but we think only one person in that 500 people building is infected. We wanted to know if that one person signal is enough for us to detect in wastewater. So in order to do that, um, we used the hospital building on campus. So um, UCSD's um, hospital called Jacobs Medical Center is in our La Jolla campus. Um, the building is shown here. Um, this hospital was actively treating COVID patients from the beginning of the pandemic. So we installed a wastewater sampler right outside this building. And we had the patient data for the number of patients admitted for COVID in this building on a daily basis. So we compared that to what we were seeing in our wastewater signal. And from when we started, um, the hospital had anywhere from two patients to 26 patients in the three month period. So we did this every day for 12 weeks. And the caseload uh, for people who are infected in the hospital were anywhere from two to 26. And every single day we were able to get uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral signal in the wastewater. And then we also were able to look at the stool samples of the infected patients to also compare to see how many of them were actually shedding the virus in their stool compared to how much we were getting in the wastewater. And we actually found a pretty good correlation between the caseload and the wastewater signal, which shows that at least we can use this data semi-quantitatively because the peaks correspond well to the peaks in wastewater. So at least we know that even if there are two people infected in a really large hospital building, we're still able to pick up that signal. So this gave us confidence to move on to our campus surveillance. So the reason UCSD um, had to have a campus surveillance was because like a lot of other universities that was closed completely during the fall term, UCSD actually had nearly 11,000 students who lived on campus during um, the fall term. And we had over 4,000 employees who worked on a daily basis on campus. So when you have nearly 11,000 or 10,000 students living on campus every day, it's very hard to ensure the safety unless you test these people every single day is a really expensive endeavor if you have to test 10,000 students on campus every single day. So this is why um, UCSD turns towards wastewater um, as a, an indicator to see whether um, they needed to test more people or not. And we used wastewater mainly because this will give the university admin an idea of which areas or which buildings they needed to focus testing on instead of testing every single person on campus. So in order to do that, we had to cover as many of the campus buildings as possible. So when we started um, this program, we started off only with the residence units or the residential dorms <clears throat> where the students were staying. So we have undergrads, graduate, and family housing, all <clears throat> of which were on campus. And when we started, we had about 68 auto samplers. So the pictures you see are pictures of the auto sampler, which were connected to the manholes, which you see on the rightmost and here. And these auto samplers were programmed to collect um, wastewater from these manholes, which are at the outlets of all these residence buildings at regular intervals of time. And every day we used to take these bottles back to our lab and do the analysis. So when we started, um, we have over 240 residential buildings on campus. So we use 68 auto samplers to cover all of these buildings. We have since expanded the program to cover over 350 buildings, which are residents as well as non-residence buildings on campus. We expanded this to non-residence buildings on campus because UCSD increased the um, number of people authorized to work on campus to 50% capacity now. So we have a lot more people working on campus on a daily basis. So in addition to this, we put um, a couple of auto samplers in isolation dorms. Isolation dorms are just two um, large buildings on campus designated for people who test positive to quarantine and people who travel, international students who travel will also have to quarantine for 10 days to two weeks in the isolation dorms before they can test again and go to their actual residences. So the way we put our samplers are, so, um, this is a Google map image of UCSD campus. 
So you see it's a pretty large campus and all these yellow dots that you see light up are the locations of the wastewater auto samplers on campus. So all of these buildings are covered um, essentially by a couple of auto samplers. So we have not left any building not covered. So just by the looks of it, you can see it's a pretty spread out campus. And um, it took a, a lot of effort to identify the right buildings and cover the entirety of the campus. So the building that you see right here is Cripps Institute of Oceanography, which is also a part of um, UCSD, um, which is slightly a little bit off campus, but it's still a part of campus. So we covered all of these areas with auto samplers. So this snapshot just shows the auto samplers concentrated on residence buildings. So all these um, orange circles you see are the auto samplers that are specific to the residence buildings. Similar to campus, our residence buildings are also very spread apart and they're not very close together. So we had to get near complete coverage of all of these residences on campus. The way we chose um, which buildings get samplers was based on the occupancy data. So this snapshot is just a zoomed in version of one of the residence complexes on campus. So um, this area is just graduate and family housing. So each green block you see is actually a building. And all of these ASO numbers are basically um, unique sample codes for the auto samplers. So the reason this area has a lot of auto samplers is because of the occupancy. For instance, just this one building here had over 450 students living in there. So with one building that had that many students, we had to get one sampler in that building because if it was positive, we had to test 400 students. But if you see the bottom, we only had one auto sampler for five, six buildings. This is because the occupancy of these buildings were slightly lower, so it was just probably 200. So since it was lesser, we put one um, auto sampler covering two or three buildings. So this way we ensured that we covered um, all of the campus with wastewater auto samplers. And to make this logistically possible, we divided how the samplers were into routes and then we had um, a team, we had seven routes. So each route was covered by one person on a golf cart picking up all of the wastewater samples from that area per day. So it takes roughly one hour for one person to finish one route. So this was um, an everyday process. So every day we used to get samples from all these um, samplers or volunteers who used to bring us samples. So the way we collected these samples were, we have a mobile app where we could directly scan the samples that are coming into our lab. So we don't have to keep going back and forth and linking the samples because there might be a lot of room for error and we don't want to inform the wrong building of a positive because of a simple human error. So on the left, you see our auto sampler, one of the auto samplers on campus with a unique barcode. On the right, you see a sample bottle with another unique barcode. So we change this barcode every day so the person who's collecting the sample, all they do is they take this app on their mobile phone, which is shown in the middle. All they do is they open the app, the camera on their phone will scan both barcodes. So once both barcodes are scanned, our backend database automatically links all of this data to the building data. So we know which buildings drain into this particular manhole, which is picked up by this sampler. So this essentially eliminates all of the other work that we would need to do in the middle to link the data back and forth since this is already preloaded. So the person just scans and that's it. Once that person scans, it updates on our database saying that this area has been, this sample has been picked up and scanned into our system. So once that's done, all of these samples are brought to our lab, which is on UCSD campus as well. So this is how our daily day looks between 9 to 10.30 or in the first hour or two, we get all of our sampler, all of the wastewater samples in the lab. And it takes us about an hour or two to concentrate these samples. And the RNA extraction is pretty straightforward. Um, that's probably the shortest step. And our RTQPCR is another two to three hours. Just the RTQPCR run takes about an hour 45. The plating takes about 20 minutes. So this way, we're able to process all 100 plus samples within five hours of when we get the sample. So the main reason we needed this turnaround was because the campus wanted a quick method um, to send out notices. 
So they wanted data on the same day, only then they could make decisions on whom to test and whom to quarantine and whom to isolate. If this data comes three days later, by then the infection might have spread, we don't know the dynamics. So it, the time was really essential for us, especially because of the number of people who are on campus and the number of people who come to campus on a daily basis. And this was also coinciding with the peak um, in the San Diego County where our positivity rates were were pretty high as well. So at that point, um, the earlier we got the data, the better. So um, using this data, we had to make sure we had an automated reporting system because um, we only have two lab techs or two of us who used to process all the sample. In the beginning, it was just me and another undergrad who used to process all of these samples every day. So we wanted to see if you could automate the data reporting system because if we manually had to go link the qPCR data to which building, it would take us a long time and you know there's also room for error. So in order to simplify that, we came up with an automated workflow. So the first part of this just involves sample collection. So the person goes to the sampler, picks up the sample, scans the sample barcode, and then brings it to the lab for analysis. So the sample, once the sample barcode is scanned, it automatically links it to a database which already has the data on the building name, the building occupancy, how many people are there in that building, and who should be notified if there's a positive. So once we have that, um, we know whom to inform. So in the lab side of things, once we process the RTQPCR, our RTQPCR data gets updated into like a Google spreadsheet, which is how it looks here. So what you see on the left is essentially how the lab data looks like. So the sample ID is just a unique ID per sample. And on the right, if you see a red, it means that that sampler was positive. If you see a number inside the red box, it is the average CQ or cycle threshold value of detection um, inside that. If you see a blue, it means that the sample was negative from that building. If you see a white, it means that that auto sampler did not pick up a sample that day, either due to a clog or low flow or some mechanical issues, which we fixed. And what you see in yellow just means it's an isolation dorm. So we expect the signal to be positive because we do know there are people who are infected who are quarantining or isolating there. So what you see on the left is how our lab data looks, which is a very simple spreadsheet. The automation that I showed you on the previous slide will take this data and automatically convert it to the public facing dashboard, which you see on the right. So what you see on the right is what the public or the uh, UCSD students or anyone who wants to view it will see. They won't see any of the back end. They won't see any of this um, Excel sheets. All they will see is an interactive map. And in that map, they can just move and click on the building to see if that building was positive that day or if it was negative that day. It not only shows that, it'll also show if that sample was um, not picked up that day, if that building is monitored, if it's not monitored. And there's also a slider on the top that you can see which shows the day, uh, which shows the calendar. So if a person wants to see uh, how this building was maybe a week before today, they can always move the slider and then see, okay, so this building was positive today, but it was not positive yesterday. So this is an interactive dashboard, which is open to the public. So any of you all could, will also be able to access the dashboard and see it. And this gets updated on a daily basis. So using this data, people can see if their building, if there was a, if the, there was a positive wastewater associated with that building, and if so, how long was the wastewater positive for that building? Then using this data, we, want, we use it to notify which of the students should go get tested. So what you see on the left is sort of a before and right is an after. So this was when the cases in San Diego County were peaking, which was January, we were recording like 4,000 cases a day. As you can see, this was how our spreadsheet looked. We had so many reds, which means so many of our samplers were picking up wastewater positives. But this is more recent, March, April, where you can see a lot more greens showing that there were very few positives. And this also mirrored our diagnostic data where our positivity decreased to less than 1% in the spring term in spite of 10,000 students living on campus. 
So throughout our surveillance program, our positivity rates have been less than 1% in spite of the uh, surrounding county having a 15% positivity rate. So the way we got this to work was um, every time we see a positive signal, we send out localized notifications. So if only that building was positive, only the residents of that building will get uh, an email notification saying you have to undergo testing because you saw a pos a positive. If that building had no wastewater positive, there wouldn't be any notification to those buildings. So we only send it to the buildings that we see a positive. And then we monitor to see if we identify the positive. If we identify the positive, we see if that person was moved to the isolation housing. If that person is moved to the isolation housing, we see if the wastewater is still positive. If the wastewater is still positive, it means there's one more or maybe more than one person um, who's still in the building who can be contributing to the signal. So we repeat the messaging again. So all of our dorms um, have a vending machine that you see on the right with self swabs. So these vending machines will um, just have uh, self-test nasal COVID swabs. So the person, once they get a notification, will just go to the bottom of their building, swipe their ID, and then get a self-test sample from the vending machine, swab themselves, and put it in the drop box that's right next to it. They use their um, mobile phone to scan their barcode so, so they will be notified of their tests within a day. So all of these um, samples from the drop box are tested every day. So this way, the student does not have to make an appointment, go stand in line to get tested, and they can just go to the vending machine at the bottom of their building and get tested, which saves um, a lot of time and personnel um, in testing as well. So using um, this system, we detected, um, we were able to detect 85% of all diagnosed cases early as a result of the wastewater signal. So because of this, um, all of the campus diagnostics were driven by wastewater. And in order to see if um, us sending a notification would increase testing of students on campus, we, we checked all of the buildings we sent positives to see how many people were taking up testing as a result of our notification. And we found in all cases there were at least a 2x to sometimes even 39x increase in testing uptake after we sent a wastewater notification. So all these spikes you see are the number of student tests we get as soon as we send a wastewater notification. Most likely they test within one day. Sometimes you'll see a peak after two days, meaning that you know they got tested within two days. But all in all, we found that within two days, we were able to identify and isolate most of these cases as a result of which um, it did not have enough time to spread or increase our positivity rates on campus. So like I mentioned earlier, um, we were also looking at our isolation dorms um, every day. So here, the first picture you will see um, where our isolation dorms are located, AS019 is a sampler that is right outside one of our isolation dorms, dorm buildings, and AS017 is slightly downstream. So the downstream sampler is just to evaluate to see if we can pick up that signal even away from the building or is it close. So through our study, we found that these two samplers were consistently positive, which makes sense because you know we know that there are people in there who are tested positive. In order to see if we can get a link between the number of people who are in the building to how much viral load we're getting in the wastewater, we compared the wastewater viral load to the number of people who are positive in the isolation dorm. We had this data um, on a daily basis. We knew on a daily basis how many of them came in, how many went out, and how many were staying in. And using this data, we were able to find a pretty good uh, link to the trends. So all of our peaks matched up, showing that the wastewater data is really good at picking up peaks, even on a smaller scale. We know on a large scale it can do that, but this shows even on a smaller building level scale, we're able to get some sort of um, a handle on how these um, signals correspond. So using this data, we are trying to actually see if we can do any data analytics and predictive models to show if some areas with historical data will have a higher risk of getting more positive than some other buildings on campus. This is done by taking historic wastewater and the diagnostic data to see if there are some areas or on campus or some resident storms which have higher positives than some other dorms which have been consistently negative. 
So this will help um, f uh, us focus testing on those areas and see if they could be hot spots before they actually become bad enough for us to not be able to do much. So this way we've prevented any outbreaks from happening on campus for the last six to eight months. So this is the end of our campus part of it. The last section of it is our San Diego County School District um, pilot program. So as a part of our elementary school program, we chose 15 schools in um, the San Diego County. So these schools were specifically chosen based on their income levels, um, the positivity rates in those areas, and some of these um, schools were very close to the border, so they had a high migrant or refugee population and their testing uptake rates were so low. So in order to still ensure that um, these schools were able to operate safely, we picked 15 of those schools and offered free um, diagnostic as well as environmental surveillance program. So the, um, this was a program that started by the um, San Diego County and they contracted UCSD to run the program for them. So we chose these schools and we did daily wastewater monitoring in these schools. We also did um, surface swaps where we swapped high touch surfaces like doorknobs, like desks, and um, these high touch surfaces in these um, schools. And the other thing was we chose these schools also based on the occupancy of these schools. These schools were operating at near full capacity during the pandemic and the positivity rates in these zip codes were upwards of 25%. So we also did weekly diagnostic testing for all of the staff, the teachers, as well as the students in the program. And we did diagnostic testing because we wanted to validate our environmental testing with diagnostic testing to see if um, we missed any samples that were not picked up. So on the right, you see one of our auto samplers in one of these elementary schools, which the students um, put stickers and drew and personalized. And on the left, you see a map of all the schools that are currently enrolled in our pilot program. And as you can see, they're very um, uh, diverse and they're split all over the San Diego County. So slightly more focused near the water because the prevalence rates there were higher, but their testing rates were lower. And currently we're using this data to see if you can prevent outbreaks on schools. And so far, none of these schools, in spite of operating at full capacity, have had um, significant outbreaks because of the constant monitoring and surveillance. And this brings me to the last portion of um, this talk, and also it shows us which direction we're heading currently. So while using RT-QPCR is a good uh, method to track SARS-CoV-2 cases, um, viral genome sequencing will help us to actually see which are the strains in circulation. Are there any variants of concern? Are there multiple people contributing to the waste stream or is it just one person? So in order to do that, we'll have to look at the viral genome sequence from wastewater. And it's much easier to look at it from wastewater because sam like um, sequencing one wastewater sample is essentially getting the sequences of every single person in that building who might be infected compared to a nasal swab where one person is equal to just one strain. So what we're doing now is we are doing um, viral genome sequencing using a tiled amplicon approach to get the whole genome from wastewater. And in the right, you will see snapshots of some of our phylogeny. So the one I've highlighted in green shows the wastewater samples um, viral genome sequence. And you can see it's identical to another sequence. And that other sequence was actually sequenced from the nasal swab of a person who tested positive and was in the same building whose wastewater we tested. So this gives us more confidence in using wastewater as a monitoring tool for tracking variants, especially when you have a lot of variants of uh, concern circulating. So based on our analysis so far, We've processed about 400 samples and we're going to be processing about 2,000 more over the next month. And from our Point Loma, Point Loma is our San Diego County's wastewater treatment plant. From the wastewater that we survey every day, these are all the lineages we detected. We do see a few variants of concern. And these are samples that they're dated up till April. So we're still processing the May and June samples now. The SASE is the school, elementary school program, and these are all the variants that we're seeing from wastewater 
um, uh, wastewater samples from the same schools. As you can see, there are a couple of variants of concern, and we saw B117 um, or the alpha variant or the UK variant much ahead of when we saw it in the diagnostic samples, actually. So with that, um, I want to conclude the talk, um, but I also want to thank all the people who made this um, whole program happen. It's a multidisciplinary effort, and without all of these people and their help, we wouldn't have been able to set up and scale and successfully operate a program like this for the last eight months. And with that, I'm done. I will be happy to take any questions if you all have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Karthi Kayan, for that informative presentation. And we will now start that live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. And Dr. Karthi Kayan, it looks like we already have some incredible questions coming in from our audience members. Our first question, is for your figure comparing PEG nano trap and membrane filtration methods, were they the same volume of the sample? Yes, they were the same volume of the sample. Um, initially, we did do 50, but when we did direct head on head comparison, we kept the same volume. We started off with 50 for all, and then we brought it down to 10. Thank you so much. And have you published? the protocol for extracting RNA with magnetic beads. Yes, yes. Um, I, we do have it in protocols.io. Um, our entire um, sampling to analysis protocol is published along with our standard curves in protocols.io. I will be, I can link, I can add the link to it if needed. Thank you so much. And I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Now, our next question from an audience member, if the wells in the plate accepted by the Kingfisher can only accept 2 ml, how did you extract 10 milliliters of raw sewage? Um, the 24 well head, we used the 24 well plates, which can take 10 mils. The 96 um, plates can only take two, but we, for the concentration part, we used a 24 well head and a magnet, which can take much more. For the extraction, we use 96. Thank you. And did you measure any physical or chemical parameters in your samples, like turbidity or pH? Um, for the county wastewater samples, yes, they measured total dissolved solids. They measured all of that. But for campus, we did not, mainly because we um, our campus samples are very upstream, so we expect a lot more solids because we're capturing it right as they flush. So in that case, we did not um, measure these extra parameters, mainly because our samples are homogenized. We don't pre-filter, so we homogenize our sample and we take the solid and liquid together. So we don't um, bias ours towards you know, um, the supernatant versus the solid. Thank you so much. Our next audience member wants to know, and this is a two-part question, as COVID-19 infection rates continue to drop, assay sensitivity is going to be increasingly important. Can you comment on the LLOD achieved using the nanotrap pre-concentration method versus HA filtration or other approaches that utilize larger starting sample volumes? And second part, do you think this level of sensitivity will be a sufficient when the infection rate drops below 1%? Um, that is a great question. And yes, uh, ironic, what we found was, um, contrary to popular belief, at the lower volume we used, we actually got a better um, sensitivity assay with Nanotrap. So we ran, um, so far we've run about um, nearly 18,000 samples. Um, and we, at least on campus, we have not missed a single case because of sensitivity. And we use this mainly because um, it was a closed system and we knew exactly how many infections were there. Because when we started our program, we in the first month we mandated every, um, every student on campus to undergo asymptomatic testing so we could validate our um, wastewater assays with the diagnostic. 
So and in the beginning, every week, all of the students had to undergo um, asymptomatic testing. So that gave us, us um, you know, a good handle on sensitivity. However, um, when we first did the comparison, we did a lot of benchmarking. We do not use a surrogate, unfortunately, like bovine or any of the other um, surrogate um, virus particles. We use directly SARS-CoV-2 viral particles instead of using a surrogate for our recoveries. We also use the same high throughput method to estimate um, viral concentrations from the Tijuana River, the Imperial Beach, the estuaries, where the concentrations are extremely dilute, but we are still able to detect um, SARS-CoV-2 viral signal from the nanotrap, which we were not able to when we filtered half a liter using HA filtration. And the other thing we found was when we used the other methods, our end goal was sequencing. So we were not able to get sequences out of um, our other methods, mainly because of uh, maybe RNA fragmentation. This is just a guess on my part, so I don't know if that's the reason. But so far, when we use our nanotrap, all of our sequences um, gave us near complete genome coverage up to 99%, even for CQ values of 37. So um, my best estimate is when we even when we have low prevalence, we would have seen in all of these samples we processed um, if we had missed any, because our initial test, we initially used HA and PEG for about two months for our campus samples before, um, you know, we switched to this and we did extensive benchmarking. So I'm pretty confident, at least from what we've seen so far, we have not missed any, we've picked up like one asymptomatic case in a building of 650. So, and we've also been able to pick up from the beat samples and our effluent samples, so we think we don't see it as an issue. We did start nanotrap with 50 mil because the manufacturer recommended us to use 50 before bringing it to 10. So we did 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 before settling on 10, and we did not find any significant difference. But this, again, could be biased because the Kingfisher homogenizes the sample better than we do. We don't do any bead beating in our um, extraction protocol as well. So we did do full metatranscriptomics as, as well as shotgun metagenomics on all our samples to see um, if we could also detect, you know, uh, the virus that way or what other communities were able to pick up. And we found that without bead beating, we're still um, able to get a decent enough community analysis uh, in terms of SARS-CoV-2. So that's, um, yeah, that's, I hope it answers. But if you have more questions, I can go into more details too. Thank you so much. Now, our next audience member wants to know if you could comment on the least water that you are testing. Um, in what way exactly? It, specifically, what white waste water are you testing? Was the question. Oh, um, we're testing San Diego County's wastewater. We're testing the campus wastewater samples and. Um, we're also doing Tijuana River, the Imperial Beach, and other um, water bodies around, in and around um, uh, San Diego County at this moment. Thank you so much. And we have time for a few more questions. Would you be willing to partner with other labs to ship samples for validation purposes? Um, samples as in wastewater samples or extracted samples for testing out? Okay, we'll have to, it doesn't say, but maybe that audience member will send another question in and we'll have that. I'm sure, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. Like we do, we um, we aliquot all of the samples that um, we've extracted. We don't store our wastewater actual raw sample for more than a day because um, we do not heat inactivate our, any of our samples and we get 150 samples a day. EHS does not want us to store the raw samples. But if we could, if it's like a couple of samples, we could store them at 4C. But we do have all of our extracted RNA from when we first started processing about 20,000 samples. We've stored all of them, so we could definitely send an aliquot for, you know, benchmarking or validation if needed. Wonderful. And that audience member just wrote back in and said waste water samples is the clarification for that. Um, we could, but we typically don't. Our whole time is 24 hours for wastewater samples because we process the same day, uh, maybe 48 hours. But if it's one or two samples that we need to send, I'm pretty sure we could. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, do you sequence the same RNA that comes off the kingfisher, or do you have to do any further cleaning or processing before sequencing? Um, we typically don't. So our samples, we use a miniaturized SWIFT protocol to do our sequencing. I think it probably already has like an, it has an ampere bleed bead cleanup step, um, but we don't do anything specific for wastewater that we don't do for other clinical samples. So it goes uh, in the same pipeline as our clinical samples on campus. So it does have an ampere bead cleanup, but we we don't do anything specific just for wastewater because we all our um, Kingfisher protocol already has a bead cleanup, which is magnetic bead based already. Thank you so much. Our next audience member says, how many of your samples are above CQ30? And what is the successful rate of those samples for sequencing? Um, almost all our samples are over 30 and um, we have a 97% um, sequence success rate so far. Um, initially, when we started, um, we used the Arctic protocol. Um, uh, Christian Anderson of the Scripps Lab um, used to do it for us, and they had a hard cutoff of 30, saying anything over 30 will not sequence. But unfortunately, 99% of our samples were over 30. Um, but I think the difference we saw is um, supposedly it extracts intact viral particles as opposed to fragments. So we've been We've, we've uh, gone all the way to 37.12 was the highest CQ we've gotten now. We sequence every single positive we're getting on campus, uh, campus as well as um, the county because the county wants to sequence all of the samples we get from Point Loma. The prevalence rates are low right now, so our CQs are definitely in the 30s. We do get, we used to get a lot in the 20s before from campus, but with low rates, we're getting all of ours are in the 30s. Our LODs, Close to 38 is hitting our LOD, but all of our sequence, all of our samples um, over 30 sequence successfully. We get 95 to 99 percent coverage for all of them. We don't consider our um, bioinformatic pipeline flags any sequence below 75 as not passing QC. So unless we get like a 75 to 80 percent coverage, it gets flagged as um, not passing QC. So sometimes we've had sequences that were CQ27 which failed. Well, we think that's probably because of a library prep artifact or something. So we've had uh, our um, we've had CQ values as low as 21 coming from campus, not the isolation dorm from an actual dorm. We've had CQs as low as 21 from wastewater all the way up to 37, 38. Thank you so much, Dr. Kardiki. And, and we have time for two more questions. Were the automatic samplers purchased by this project, or will you were you able to borrow some from the county? And what kind of energy source do they require? Um, all of them are battery operated. We didn't. Um, the county paid for us to buy them for their projects, and the funding enabled us to buy our uh, campus auto samplers. They are all battery operated, and they pick up time weighted composites. So the um, County samples are flow weighted, but our campus ones are time weighted. So flow weighted is obviously better, but they're really expensive. So we use the water meter data and we use peppermile model virus and others for using the data quantitatively. So we typically don't use the um, wastewater campus data quantitatively. We use it qualitatively. We only use the isolation dorm and the Point Loma data quantitatively because we use those for modeling, but for just building data, they only want to know yes or no. We screen for three genes. We only consider it a positive if all three genes in both the replicates are amplified. Um, otherwise, we call it inconclusive, but so far um, we've had, um, I guess, all of ours have been amplified in three genes in both the replicates. We do N1, N2, and E for SARS-CoV-2. We multiplex it. Our, QPCR is also miniaturized, so we put in much less quantity so we can um, scale it up, uh, you know, cost effectively. And I guess there was one that I see how sensitive is your uh, surveillance. Um, it is pretty sensitive, so we've not missed any case except for four cases, but that was because the campus, um, because the samplers did not pick up a sample. We get one in our largest occupied building has about 650 students, and we picked up one asymptomatic case in that building as well. 
Thank you so much. And our final question we have time for, have you observed any inhibition with the nanotrap pre-concentration method? And if so, how do you, do you overcome that? Um, if you're talking about PCR inhibition, we have not encountered that so far. Um, we do homogenize our samples, so there are pretty big chunks of solids that go into our sample, so we do not let it sit for a while and take the supernatant. But when we do dilution series as well as an inhibition panel, we do not see it being significantly inhibited. Ironically, we've had inhibitions from our surface swab samples based on the detergent or disinfectant the person used to sanitize the school desk. But for wastewater so far in all of the samples process, we've not seen significant enough um, uh, CQ value shift for us to flag it as, you know, we cannot use this data quantitatively. Dr. Karasi Khan, thank you so much for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any final comments for our audience before we close? Um, nothing specific, but feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any additional questions um, via email, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, I want to thank you again for your time and your important research and presentation. And we also want to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Saris Nanosciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. Encourage to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Be safe. Oh, Bye -bye. Um, I had a quick comment as well. So if sure. um, we're also planning to release our campus data as a preprint um, in the next week or so. So we're also happy to share raw data for others who are interested in looking at the um, you know, the campus data as well as our Point Loma data. So we're making all of our data as well as the entire workflow open source so others would be able to view and implement it. Thank you so much, Dr. Carthy Can. And again, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.